The history of math is our intellectual foundation for understanding science. Science. Beautiful, remarkable, awe-inspiring science. It's the creative foundation for our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. Space. It's not just the final frontier. It's not just an infinite, three-dimensional platform where entities have position and direction. Space is a profound reminder that we are part of this giant construct of atoms, molecules, elements, compounds, voids, masses, and gravity that work together as a unifying body that moves us in the universe's dance of life. Starting with the Big Bang, we began to exist even though we were in the dust scattered across the inflating universe. Many of us examine the stars to understand where we came from and where we are going. We observe their movement to understand the beauty that encircles us every night as the sun sets, and we embrace its vast magnificence while identifying with our minuteness in this tremendously grand structure that is the universe. The written history of astronomical observation dates back to over 2,000 years. Observing the night sky has evolved and developed so that we now have an extensive list of space telescopes that bring us up close to the beauty of our cosmos. It is utterly amazing to think that a little over 2,000 years ago, this data gathering process began to advance through the brilliant work of the ancient astronomer Hipparchus. Hipparchus was born in 190 BCE in the kingdom of Bithynia, which today is now known as the region of northern Anatolia in Turkey. We know about Hipparchus through the writings of ancient historians, mathematicians, and scientists, including Ptolemy, who utilized Hipparchus's astronomical findings for his infamous work, Almagest. Ptolemy admired him so much that he referred to him as, quote, that enthusiastic worker and lover of truth, unquote. Hipparchus has been referenced in the works of Strabo, who wrote geography, and Pliny the Elder, who wrote natural history. By the 4th century, Hipparchus had been referenced by Alexandrian mathematicians Pappus, Theon, and Hypatia. Unfortunately, very little of Hipparchus's works survive. He wrote at least 14 books, which included a star catalog and one of the first trigonometric tables in his work called Of Lines Inside a Circle. This trigonometric table included several values of a chord function, which was quite a feat considering his work came from 200 BCE. Hipparchus authored on the length of the year, which were his observations on the sun's motions and orbits. He studied the moon's movement and determined a period of an eclipse by comparing his data with Babylonian data from 300 years prior. When Hipparchus flourished as a mathematician and astronomer, it had already been known that the moon moved at varying speeds. However, no data showed the actual size of the orbits. Hipparchus was the first astronomer to determine the size of the moon's orbit. Furthermore, as noted by the great historian Pliny the Elder, Hipparchus was one of the first astronomers to show that lunar eclipses occur five months apart and that solar eclipses occur seven months apart. He also revealed that the sun could be hidden twice in 30 days, depending on the viewer's location. Thus, many of our astronomical findings would not have been realized if it were not for the works of Hipparchus. His systematical techniques helped him to discover and measure the Earth's precession, and this discovery was no eureka moment. It was an extensive application of trigonometry, trigonometry tables, and applications of spherical trigonometry and geometry. The Earth's precession can be understood by looking at a gyroscope or, more simply, a spinning top. The top spins on its tip. Where one grabs it to make it spin is called the crown. The crown, as defined in physics, indicates the axis of the top. The axis is the line in which the body of the top spins around. However, when you spin a top, you will notice that the axis also rotates. 
As it speeds up, the axis makes a smaller circular motion. When it slows down, the axis makes a larger circular motion. The axis does not spin as fast as the top. The gravity of the Earth causes the axis to spin, which in physics is referred to as torque. So, in the case of Earth, as the world spins on its axis while spinning around the sun, the axis, which is represented as the North Pole, is also spinning, albeit very slowly. This spinning is the Earth's axial precession. Historically, this was referred to as the precession of the equinoxes. And the Earth has two equinoxes, the spring equinox and the fall equinox. An equinox is when the sun's rays are perpendicular to the Earth's equator, which means that the sun's rays to the equator is zero degrees. Hipparchus discovered the Earth's precession by following and measuring the movements of the stars, specifically Spica and Regulus, two of the brightest stars in our night sky. In his observations, he measured the longitudes of these two stars. Then he compared his numbers to the data of previous scientists and astronomers. He discovered that the bright star Spica had moved two degrees compared to its location during the fall equinox. Through this calculation, he realized that the precession of our equinoxes moves at a rate between one and two degrees. Hipparchus concluded that because the Earth's axis moves so slowly, it would complete a rotation about every 36,000 years. Well, this number was further validated in Ptolemy's work, Almagest. And what is really impressive about this discovery is that Hipparchus was not that far off. We have since realized and discovered that the Earth's axis completes a rotation approximately every 26,000 years. Before I continue, please give a listen to my next sponsor. Without these sponsors, the funding for this podcast would not be possible. Everybody wants more energy. Even when you exercise and take care of your body, sometimes that energy still isn't there. If you can relate, consider Athletic Greens. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free foods, Athletic Greens, also known as AG1, is a product that you can drink every day. It helps give you more energy, helps with your gut health, and it optimizes your immune system. AG1 gives you 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and adaptogens. For less than $3 a day, you can reclaim your health. What I really like about AG1 is that for every purchase, they donate to organizations to help feed kids in need. Also, Athletic Greens will send you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just visit athleticgreens.com slash emerging. That is E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and obtain the ultimate daily nutrition insurance. In 398 CE, about 600 years after Hipparchus, Synesius of Cyrene, one of Hypatia's students and disciples, wrote a letter to the military leader Pylaemenes. Along with that letter, Synesius had sent Pylaemenes an astrolabe. Synesius's mission was to influence and encourage the politicians of Rome to study and learn the value of science. So, Clearly, the importance of educating politicians on the value of science has been an endeavor among scientists for thousands of years. Hmm. So, in this letter, Synesius writes, quote, The great Ptolemy and the divine band of his successors were content to have it as one of their useful possession. For the sixteen stars it made sufficient for the night clock. Hipparchus merely transposed the stars and inserted them into the instrument, unquote. So here we have an early reference that the astrolabe might have actually been Hipparchus's invention. The astrolabe was the evolution and combination of an armillary sphere, a celestial map, and a diopter. An armillary sphere is a spherical frame of rings representing the star's celestial latitude and longitude. It often has an axis that is characterized by an arrow. So, <laughs> if you've ever been shopping at Home Goods, more than likely you've seen a multitude of them in the decor department. 
which I think is kind of cool. So, a diopter is a measuring tube with a protractor. It surveyed over far distances, which was useful for measuring land, for building structures and aqueducts, and for measuring the position of the stars. Heron of Alexandria, in the first century, referenced the diopter in his work called the diopter, and indicated that his instrument worked as a general sighting tool and as a level. So, the astrolabe, a combination of these objects, allowed astronomers to map out the stars and project the night sky as a celestial sphere onto the plane of the equator. The astrolabe eventually evolved into a flat, user-friendly, portable mechanism. Metaphorically speaking, with the astrolabe, users were then able to hold the galaxy in the palms of their hands. The main body of the astrolabe is called the mater. The front part of the mater cradles the parts of the astrolabe together in the womb. At the top of the astrolabe is a cross with 24 symbols etched around the limb with an M at the bottom. The cross represents noon, and the M represents midnight. Etchings around the outer rim represent degrees, hours, or even both. The plates that sit inside the womb are called climates. These climates are mapped with a celestial sphere. The climates can be interchanged depending on an individual's latitude and location of the observation. All that the user can observe in three-dimensional space is flattened onto the plates of the astrolabe. Thus, the final tool that is needed to read an astrolabe is the imagination. So, if you were to hold an astrolabe in your hand, you would imagine the night sky as a dome of stars above you. This enormous imagined sphere is a stereographic projection. The stereographic projection is the mapping of three-dimensional spherical objects onto a two-dimensional plane, which in this case is the astrolabe. For a visual, please visit me at mathsciencehistory.com where you can see the graphics that I created that identify the parts of the astrolabe as well as the intricacies of stereographic projection. Stereographic projection is essential for the astrolabe because it preserves circles and angles. The astrolabe assists in determining the angle at which one can see the moon or the stars. It also measures altitude, latitude, and the width of rivers and valleys. It serves as a compass and helps determine the day's hour. However, unlike a map that provides preserved distances or areas on a ratio scale, stereographic projection creates a projected map of curves referenced by inscribed angles. Again, for a visual and instructions on how to read an astrolabe, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com where I provide a graphic that explains all the intricate details of an astrolabe. Hipparchus, thus using this concept of stereographic projection, created a map by imagining a perpendicular line that connected each star to a point on the plates of the astrolabe. By using this astrolabe and observing fixed stars, Hipparchus was also able to measure one's geographical latitude and the time of day or night at that geographical latitude. And because he had such an extensive background working with trigonometry and understanding the angles of projection, using a grade grid, he was able to assign a value of latitude and longitude to various locations on Earth. These multiple locations of reference allowed him to design the interchangeable plates on the astrolabe that the viewer could change depending on where they were located. Also, this method of determining the latitude and longitude of geography contributed to his treatise called Against the Geography of Eratosthenes. In this work, Hipparchus literally redefined the cartography of the world map by correcting many of the geographical mistakes that Eratosthenes made in his own work, Geography. Hipparchus was a tremendous astronomer. At the Griffith Observatory in my hometown of Los Angeles, there is a 40-foot monument with a hollow bronze armillary sphere at the top. There are six great astronomers carved into this magnificent monument. The only one from antiquity is Hipparchus, and rightly so. He was one of the very first astronomers who not only intrigued our curiosity and imagination with stereographic projection, but he also defined the Earth's geography. 
Additionally, he was one of the first to not only observe, but also mathematically and trigonometrically define his observations. As we ride along with the stars and the galaxies in our world, we dance among our own personal atoms, molecules, voids, and gatherings. Hipparchus's mathematical astronomy grounded us in understanding where we are in the world and in the universe. He helped us to see the choreography of the universe and showed how we move with it. Thus, his observations piqued our curiosity and inspired us to imagine our place as we stand on this little blue dot moving through space as observers and participants in this glorious dance of the stars. Until next time, carpe diem! Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you enjoyed this, please remember to leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you're interested in the transcripts, you can visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. If you're interested in watching the show on YouTube, you can just search for Math Science History with Gabrielle Burchak. And finally, if you're interested in supporting Math Science History, you can donate through my website's coffee button, or you can visit Patreon at patreon.com slash math science history. All tiers are now pay what you want starting at $1.39 because $1.39 is a happy number, which means that when you sum the square of each digit, it eventually reaches the value of one. Until next time, carpe diem!